see if there's time left to do the other. They're both relatively short. So this was a uh, patient that <coughs> uh, l last year when I was on neuro-ophthalmology rotation came into triage clinic <coughs> complaining of uh, double vision, some headache, and maybe a little facial numbness on the left side and uh, was referred down to us and we uh, took a look at him and came to find out that three months before he came to us, he had had an episode of double vision. And he went to a, a, you know, a local eye doctor and, and got a new refraction and actually his diplopia kind of went away. And so he kind of let it go for a while and <coughs> about a month before he came to us, the d double vision came back and then the numbness began a week before he uh, came back, came to us. And then his left eyelid started to, to droop down and that's uh, once the headache started, he decided it was time to come in. His past medical history and, and uh, other histories were essentially negative. He's a healthy guy, uh, other than a refractive error, no ocular history. And uh, he denied any swallowing difficulties or breathing difficulties, no fatigability with uh, either systemically or with his uh, double vision, and had no history of a head trauma or eye trauma. On exam, he was 20-20, no APD, and the pupils were equal. Uh, he did have a, a minus two deficit in up gaze, the left eye. His, his color uh, was full. He maybe had some mild red desaturation in the left eye. Uh, computational visual field was full. He did have a ptosis and uh, a left hypotropia uh, measured at 35 diopters and a subjective numbness to his left lower face kind of in a, in a you know, V2, V3 kind of distribution. Um, al again, on also on exam, he did not have a Kogan lid twitch and no fatigability. And uh, when you tested obicularis oculi uh, <coughs> strength, it was equal and normal. And this is a picture he took of himself, and he let me, he sent to me for use with this. Uh, so this is attempted up gaze. Uh, as you can see in the right eye, he's, he's looking up, and, and you can note the ptosis on the left and the, the um, hypertropia, the, the deficit in upgaze, I should say. So from uh, the history and exam, we came up with a differential diagnosis, uh, which included, you know, a third nerve palsy, either pupil sparing, which, you know, he had equal pupils at this time, or possibly a, an evolving third nerve that would eventually involve oh. a pupil. <coughs> I thought it'd be useful just to go over kind of the the different causes of, of these, if you c can kind of split them up. Oftentimes, uh, the aneur an aneurysm will give you a pupil involving third nerve because the, the parasympathetic fibers run parallel and, and right next to the posterior communicating artery as the third nerve travels parallel to that uh, uh, vessel. A compressing mass of some sort would, would potentially more often give you a pupil involving third nerve, a trauma, uncle herniation, uh, pituitary apoplexy, there's other you know, parts of the history that would just uh, suggest that, and a, and a zoster infection. Pupil sparing third nerves are often uh, due to ischemic microvascular disease, this uh, cavernous sinus syndrome, um, arteritis, such as giant cell arteritis, and aberrant regeneration can give you a, a third with a pupil sparing. Other items in our differential included myasthenia, you know, as we were testing for it with the Kogan lid twitch and the obicularis weakness, thyroid eye disease, uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, and uh, possibly orbital pseudotumor, although they didn't have any of the associated symptoms that would suggest the uh, diagnosis. So I thought it would be useful also to discuss when you image, uh, do get obtain an MRI, uh, uh, head and neck for these patients, orbits, I guess, head and neck. Any pupil involving ophthalmoplegia, uh, they deserve imaging. If it's a pupil, sp you know, if the pupil's normal, as it was in our case, you, m you would decide to image if they're younger than 50, unless you have, you know, a really clear uh, etiology for ischemic, you know, microvascular problems, long-standing diabetes, like type 1 diabetics, or uh, uncontrolled hypertension for years, then you, you may decide, if, even if they're under 50, to, to hold off on imaging. Uh, an incomplete third, you know, which in our case, you know, would this patient would fit in, it could be an evolving third that eventually will, you know, 
give you an anisocoria. Any other cranial nerve involvement uh, would deserve imaging. Um, children less than 10 are symptoms, if they've been long standing with no improvement, can certainly uh, justify Im imaging. So in our patient, we uh, obtained an MRI, which was normal, and also a CTA, head and neck, to evalu evaluate his uh, uh, perfusion, and, and it, it was also normal. <coughs> <coughs> a lab, lab test that you could order would include a CBC, uh, blood pressure, fasting, blood sugar, HbA1c, sed rate, CRP, and platelets, and tensilon test, um, and uh, other things that aren't on here, acetylcholine receptor, you know, tests uh, to rule out myasthenia. So in our patient, uh, he did have an elevated white count, um, and... Uh, you know, this was, this was all, uh, these first, let's see, one, these first four uh, bullets were obtained on the day of evaluation because uh, we sent the patient over to the emergency room to get imaging and at the same time uh, recommended these tests. He was admitted because of his elevated white count and he obtained an LP because of the headache and the facial numbness and these other, uh, they were worried about a central nervous system infection. The LP was normal and then, uh, Subsequently, as, as his hospitalization <coughs> progressed, they did obtain acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies, which was high. Blocking antibodies were low, which is kind of characteristic for most myasthenic patients. The, the binding antibodies will be high, but the blocking antibodies are, are less commonly found. Uh, we did not get musk antibodies. So his treatment, actually, he resolved spontaneously and uh, you know they sent him home with this diagnosis of myasthenia. He does occasionally get diplopic by the end of the day, and I think he's had sub subsequent follow-ups even since then. This was about a year ago. Ptosis went away, his pain resolved spontaneously. Uh, his CT chest was normal, and uh, we did get him to the neuromuscular uh, folks for management of his symptoms and treatment. And so this was, uh, you know, afterwards, so his ptosis had resolved, his diplopia had resolved, and just overall looked better than that first picture. <laughs> so uh, just a quick review on myasthenia. Oftentimes there is fatigability. It's one of the hallmarks, uh, although when he presented, he didn't have that. So it goes to show you that there's a lot of variability with, uh, with, with this uh, finding. Uh, women are affected more often than men. It tends to be a, a, a disease that affects middle-aged individuals. Uh, Often, 85 to 90 percent of patients will have ocular disease, and it often will show up before the systemic symptoms. So, ophthalmologists and optometrists are often uh, the individuals to first uh, find this. 15 percent will resolve spontaneously <coughs> without treatment. There is an associated with association with thymic hyperplasia and thymoma. So, you always need to get a CT of the chest and and the impotence to. Uh, to uh, remove a thymoma or an enlarged thymus is, is low. Uh, it's also associated with other autoimmune diseases, graves, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Um, the most sensitive test to, the, to uh, diagnose myasthenia is the single fiber EMG. Uh, it approaches, I think, 95% sensitivity. Uh, there's the tensilon test, adrophonium, or prostigmine, which has a longer half-life, uh, which can be performed in the office, you know, under controlled conditions you need to have atropine you know around in case they have a significant uh, adverse reaction uh, the acetylcholine receptor antibody tests are very useful as they were at our patient with with the uh, uh, different types that have different levels of sensitivity uh, the, the other uh, things you can perform in the office is the rest test where you have them just lay their head down close their eyes for 30 minutes and, and give them a chance really and uh, and then once and then have them sit up, open their eyes, and, and notice if there's a difference in mitosis this, or, or the ophthalmoplegia. Uh, the ice test is another where you, you you place a you know cool washcloth with the ice bag you know on top of it and give them a good five minutes of of just cold therapy and then again measure their ptosis before and after to see if there's an improvement. I think that's it with that. Any questions or comments from <coughs> faculty? <laughs> yeah.